Today we want to point out something that we've all dealt with. We've all been on probably both sides of this, but it's we all face critical people. People that find the wrong negative thing every time. Sometimes there are people that it's the unspiritual gift of criticism that they have, okay? It's not prophecy, it's not miracles, it's not uh, healing, divine healing. They have the unspiritual gift of criticism and they love to share their gift with everyone, okay? Uh, it's, tip, it's difficult when you find somebody that's negative. So how do we deal with these people that overly criticize? For some of us in this room, it's that boss that we never see until something goes wrong. They never come and say, man, that was a great third quarter. Man, you hit all your numbers. That was incredible. Uh, the company's doing good. We only see them when they're frustrated at something that went wrong and they criticize or they bring out the negative rather than the balanced approach of good leadership. Others of you, maybe it's somebody you face, uh, somebody that's a, a struggle with maybe an adult parent. You know, you're an adult and you're parenting, but your parents are still being tough on you. They don't like how maybe you're doing certain things, how you spend your money or how you're raising the kids. You need to do it this way. Always giving you their critique. Maybe it's your spouse. Look over there at Tamara real quick. All right, just make sure she knows I love her, okay? Uh, maybe they don't like always the way you look or the way they talk, and they're always trying to nitpick a little bit on this and this and this. Husbands can do this. Wives can do this. They don't like how you do certain things. They don't like the, way, the certain outfit that you like to wear more regularly than others or, or, or something the way you do things around the house, the way they load the dishwasher, the way you put things up, the uh, way you leave your underwear on the floor. I don't know what you do that, that maybe frustrates your spouse, but whatever it is, how you chew gum. My wife, this is, this is a uh, pet peeve of my wife. No matter how I chew my gum, if I chew it softly, if I chew like I enjoy it, which I prefer to do, and, and uh, blow bubbles with it, all that kind of stuff, she will tell me regularly, hey, easy on chewing the gum, will you? You know, and it, I wish she was being critical, but you got to follow trends, okay? And my mom used to say the same thing to me when I was growing up. So I'm like, she's got me on that one, okay? So, but how do we do? How do we do this? How do we show this kind of love if there's somebody that's very, very, very negative and critical in our lives? I'm just curious. Has everybody heard anything critical about church here? How many raise your hand and say, yeah, I've heard some critical things about church? Okay, I'll go back and be in the fetal position the rest of the service, okay? You know, no, sure we do. It's, church is an easy target because everybody's got their varying opinions. Some like the lights bright, some like it low, some like the music loud, some like it soft, some like the temperature a certain way, and some like a different way. Somebody likes me in a suit, some people like me in jeans. You know, everybody's got their opinion, right? So it's easy to criticize. If you've already criticized two or three things already this morning in the service, this message could be for you, okay? All right. Yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't setting you up, okay? I promise. I wasn't setting you up on that. But the reality is church can be one of those settings too. But no matter what you do or where you are, if you're trying to make a difference in this world, if you're trying to be proactive and trying to help others, you're going to run into it at some point. In any kind of relationship, somebody at some point is going to be critical of how you're doing it. There was a quote by Aristotle that said, To avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. Now, I don't know if that was Aristotle or that was... Uh, the, the guy on, uh, what was his name on Hogan's Hero? It sounds like Hogan's Hero, the, the, the big German guard on, on Hogan's Heroes. What was his name? Schultz. Schultz. It kind of sounds like that too. Either way, I don't want to criticize Aristotle, okay? But uh, if you do nothing, say nothing, and try to be nothing, somebody's going to criticize you too for being a lazy bum, you know? At some point, they're like, what, what is he for? He's a bump on the log somewhere, okay? By the way, that's a country boy statement, bump on a log. That's, okay, I just didn't know if you'd ever heard that before, okay? 
But if we're going to be different from this world as believers in Christ, guess what? We'll be targets. How many know that's true? We'll be criticized, we'll be persecuted because we see things differently because we're looking through the lens of Scripture and we're trying to be something that God wants us to be, not what the world wants us to be. And so get ready, you will be an easy target to be criticized. Some of you in your relationships, you find that this is really hurting your relationships. It's wrecking certain relationships because someone in that relationship is very critical. So how do we as followers of Jesus respond to criticism? So here's some strategies on how to respond. The first strategy is this. Often, you don't respond. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. You say, say nothing? When they have just chewed my ear off, when they have literally just tackled me so hard that it took my breath away, I say nothing? I want to give them a piece of my mind. I want to tell them what's all wrong with them. Well, I don't even like the clothes you're wearing right now. I want to tell them, well, I don't think you're doing that great a job in your division of this company either. We all want to respond. This, is, this can be unbelievably freeing when we say absolutely nothing to someone who criticizes us. Just because someone criticizes you does not obligate you to respond. Just because they're throwing a spear out there at you does not mean you have to grab it and throw it right back at them. So what does Jesus do in these kind of moments? How did Jesus handle criticism? I love how he responded, and this is why this point comes to the surface today in a strategy Sometimes you just don't respond. Look what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says. And obviously Simon Peter had a great view of watching Jesus during the trial and during all of the suffering that he went through. He watched and he listened to how Jesus responded. It says this, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not what? Retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Interesting. You say, wow. Peter says that, man, they hurled criticism and insults at him. What would those have been? What did Jesus face as criticism? Well, some said he was a friend of sinners, and that was not a compliment to them. Today, if you say, wow, Pastor Ron's a friend of sinners. He knows a lot of people that don't know Jesus, and he's reaching out to them. Some of us in the Christian setting would say, wow, that's, that's an incredible compliment. But no, this wasn't said as a compliment. They were saying it as a criticism. Interesting. Some would say he was a drunk. Some would say he ate too much. He's gluttons. He's hanging out with drunkards and gluttons. That he partied all the time. He was really a, a bad partier. And, and he was a lunatic. That he, he was a false god. That he was a heretic. And on and on and on they criticized Jesus. But I just want you to know. If Jesus, who was perfect and sinless on this earth, is going to be criticized. How many know somebody is going to criticize you and me? If they would criticize him who displayed love to people and worked miracles for people that were in desperate state, you know if they would criticize him, there's going to be points in our life they're going to take their shots at us. Absolutely. Notice he did not retaliate or defend himself. He didn't complain. He simply entrusted himself to his father. How do we respond? Sometimes you don't. And when you don't, be free. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? I said, be free. Just because they have access to you doesn't mean you're demanded to respond to them. The Bible says in Psalms 19, 11, it says a person's wisdom. Well, you know what? We need to read this one together. Let's read it together. A person's wisdom yields patience it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. To overlook an offense. Be free of it. What does that mean? 
Overlooking an offense does not mean the same thing as pretending it didn't happen. Doesn't mean that. A couple of the Hebrew words here literally means to pass over, to get over it. To overlook an offense is a form of forgiveness. But it's not necessarily meaning to forgive something in the past tense. You know what I'm talking about? Be free of this on the spot. You know what happens? A lot of us are free of it after what? Three years of mulling over it and chewing it over and reliving the experience and staring at the ceiling at night and being frustrated at people. Weeks go by, months go by, years go by, and we're never free of that offense. Listen to me. You can forgive somebody that's critical of you in lifetime. Lifetime. Right there on the spot. It hits you and it's like water off a duck's back. Sorry, another country boy statement. Sorry about that. I need, I need to put a definition of, uh, of terms for country boy preaching to a congregation, okay? It doesn't phase you. Rhinoceros hide, man. Just tough. There's a shell that God helps you establish that you are able to forgive somebody immediately because it doesn't offend you and it doesn't bother you. You overlook it. You're able to do that. Personally, as a pastor over the years, I wish I could say for years I was so good at this. I think even after years, I'm still probably trying to learn this example of forgiving lifetime. But there's been moments that, sure, wow, somebody's upset at the church or somebody's that upset at people in the church and they're sharing their frustration and their criticisms. And man, I can be just like any of you sitting here today. As a matter of fact, front row and center today, I'm preaching to myself. Guard myself when things like this happen. Learn to forgive. Sometimes you let the Spirit of God, listen to this, lift you above it all. And you choose to forgive in real time. I'm not going to let something lower take me off of a higher calling. God's called us to live above this stuff. And when you're at the workplace and you've got the critical person constantly, you know, the negative nanny coming in all the time, blowing off this stuff that she's frustrated with, man, you got to live above it. Live above it. So sometimes you don't respond at all, but the second strategy is sometimes you respond carefully. Notice I didn't say react instinctively because you and I in our messed up nature our sinful nature when somebody zings us what do we want to do zing right back at him you punch me I'm gonna punch you square in the nose man that's the old Ron that's the old Ron God's called me to a higher purpose so you don't react but with a very very different approach you respond See, reacting is emotion. Responding means we're going to be spirit-led in this journey. In the rest of our conversation, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit guide my words and my response and my expression. Even the very countenance of my face, I want to be spirit-led. There's a, a powerful example of this in the Old Testament. I don't want to spend a long time. I just want you to see in the scripture, both in Jesus' model, but also even in the Old Testament, there were, I mean, criticism's been around forever, okay? But it's interesting. Here's this guy named Gideon who was a judge that was saving the people of Israel, and there was a battle, and he gets everybody together, and he rushes out, and he wins this great victory for Israel, but the neighboring people weren't happy about it because they didn't get to be invited to the fight. And it says here in Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8 of Judges, it says, Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. One translation says they criticized him sharply. Okay, here's the guy. He's the point man. He's the, he's the leader of the pack, man. He's the point guy. It's interesting. What did he do? He didn't defend himself. He didn't fight back. He didn't have a sharp argument back to them. He didn't say, that's not fair. You know, he didn't do that. He simply responded, and Scripture says, 
He answered them. Interesting. He answered them. He gave a clear, very rational, very spirit-led response, not reaction. Interesting. The scripture says in verse 3, when the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, what's it say? Their anger subsided. Hmm. There's sometimes when a real answer or response can give a critical person an understanding that they didn't have before we offer an explanation. So here's what I mean by that. Somebody from your family calls you and says, why didn't you call me back? I called you. I left a message. Happened to all of us. Every one of us have had that kind of, somebody's frustrated and, they, and they're saying, you never call back. Okay, here's your chance to be either reactionary or spirit-led. And you can say, you know, I'm so sorry, but I was in a meeting with the executives and there was no way I could respond in that time. But I, I did try to call you back. If you'll check, I, I, I think I'm pretty sure if you look at this, you'll see, oh, yeah, there it is. There on your phone, there's the missed call. I did try to call you back. We've all been on the receiving side of that when we've been frustrated at something and somebody gives us a good, calm response, a clear answer, not a big defense mechanism or anything, just calmly responds, led by the Spirit. And all of a sudden, guess what? Our frustration when we're the one critical and upset, all of a sudden we're calmed because somebody treated us with what? Some mercy, some forgiveness, some real time, you know, looking over the offense, okay? That's what we can do in those kind of settings. We got to remember God's expecting us to live a higher example, but there's always going to be somebody critical. Why are you going back to school? You don't need to go back to school. Good grief, you're in the middle of your life. Why you go back and get another degree? You're going to do what? You're going to that Wednesday night prayer service? Didn't you go on Sunday? Why do you need to keep going? There's something wrong with you? Why are you serving all the time? Why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Why, why, are, you, why are you going to be a stay-at-home mom? You're so talented. You should get out there. You're so gifted. God's giving you a gift. Get out there. Don't be a stay-at-home mom. Then if you choose to be a stay-at-home mom, uh, yeah, or if you choose to go out in the workplace and somebody's saying, why aren't you a stay-at-home mom? You should be guiding your kids. And you personally, you're like, poor ladies can't, can't win for losing, you know, in any way you try. You know, sometimes you're criticized by the, all the different voices. There's sometimes when a real answer or response can give a critical person an understanding that they don't have before when you offer them an explanation. Sometimes you just offer context. Sometimes just a soft answer repels the wrath and it gives an explanation and it makes sense. But man, what do you do when your friend unleashes you on you? Or maybe, maybe your coworker that you're hanging out with all day long just is starting to pick you apart. What do you do when it's your mom and dad and they're just not satisfied and they keep riding you and riding you? You know what you do? You wait before you respond. Did you hear what I said? Here's why. You wait before you respond because when emotions are high, wisdom is low. You need to say amen on that. When I'm frustrated, my brain's not working like it should be. My wisdom isn't at its best. When I'm frustrated and I'm impatient and I'm wanting something to change or I'm hurt by something or I'm angry at something, yeah, Emotions are high and wisdom is low. So it's best to wait to respond. Hmm. How many of you have had somebody send you a fiery email or a, or a critical text? And you grab that phone and you're starting to squeeze it and your knuckles are turning white because you're upset and angry. And boy, you can, as fast as your little thumbs can go, you're, you're giving them a piece of your mind right now. Whatever you need to do, you need to wait before you push sin. Some of my responsibilities in helping our churches around uh, the Chicagoland area and across Illinois, there's sometimes I have to deal with some not so comfortable settings. 
and I have to respond to an email that somebody's frustrated at or anything else, and boy, there are times, Rich, I can polish one up so fast. Smoke's coming from my keyboard. It is amazing. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just says, slow down, Ron. Slow down. Act in wisdom here. Don't react. Respond. And all of a sudden, he, he has me edit that last sentence. And I'm like, ooh, that does not go in this email. Let's delete that, okay? Now I work a little longer, and I'm, I'm kind of calm now, but all of a sudden, the frustration builds. He's like, elbows me and says, hey, get rid of those. That's not a good phrase. And so all of a sudden, he's literally guiding you in your response because you've slowed down and you've chosen to be spirit-led rather than emotionally led. How many relate to that? We all relate to that. All of us can respond yes and amen. Oftentimes, can I just tell you this fact? A lot of times criticism isn't always about you. Sometimes it's about a person born, that's birthing this criticism out of hurt of their own lives. They're a wounded individual and they're hurting and you're just convenient. How many have ever been that convenient person? You walk in the office and you almost get to your desk and all of a sudden somebody just blasts you and you're like, what in the world just hit me? It really had nothing to do with you as you face all the criticism and everything. But all of a sudden you realize, oh man, I was just convenient. That happens because sometimes their criticism is based on something else. Maybe they're dealing with something they don't like about themselves, not so much about you. Maybe they're dealing with some inconsistency of their own life. Oftentimes behind every anger is a hurt. And instead of you and I feeling defensive, what we should have is compassion. We should have some tough love that we're like, okay, this is where I got to reach down deep and show some love to somebody that's struggling. I don't know about you, but I want to try to love through those wounds of people instead of always taking it personally. I want to work through that and love through it and learn how to forgive in, in lifetime. The third strategy on how we should respond to critical people is occasionally you listen, and are you ready for this? Buckle up. You make a change. I make a change because they may just have a good point. Somewhere in all of their fur flying and frustration and anger and everything else, maybe deep in all that stuff is a nugget of truth that would help us become more like Jesus wants us to be. How about that? <laughs> Not a lot of amens on that one. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. You know, you recognize that there's actually something you can learn and embrace and even love from a harsh critic sometimes, as well as those critics that are maybe coming with constructive criticism that has your best interest in mind. Somebody that you know loves you, and they're coming with something that, yeah, it, it takes you down a notch or two, and you realize you're having to face something, but maybe inside of that criticism is something that God wants you to grow in. Sometimes the people who are being hard on you are right because you and I just won't listen. If everybody's telling you, if you kind of hear the same thing that you're having a problem and everybody's telling you you've got this problem and you're hearing it from multiple settings and multiple angles, maybe you've got a problem. <laughs> if your wife who really, really loves you and definitely has your best interest in mind, keeps telling you that, hey, you're just being so hard on the kids. Your, your volume level is not corrective. It's just blatant angry, and you're just yelling at the top of your lungs. Maybe she's not trying to be critical of you. Maybe she's trying to guard you because she loves you and knows how vital your influence and input to the kids are. Maybe your criticism is something you need to pay attention to. That goes both ways, husbands and wives. If every one of your friends, if your mom, if your dad, your grandma, your great-grandma, your professors at school, 
your sorority sisters. Sorority sisters, not sorority. <laughs> sorority. <laughs> Quit laughing at me. I'm, I'm feeling like you're criticizing me now. <laughs> your sorority sisters. If everybody's telling you you're dating the devil, maybe you need to cast that demon out and get a good man that God has in store for you, that's somebody that's all about the higher calling that God has for your life. But everybody's telling you that, and you're thinking, everybody's judging me, everybody's criticizing me. Maybe there's some truth in it, that you're just missing it because you're not listening. It's so important. Look at Proverbs. I love Proverbs because it's a book of wisdom. I loved our series we did a couple of summer ago on, on Proverbs. Look at what it says. If you li- No, you need to say this one too. Come on, say it with me. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will be home among what? The wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. Guys, look at this. When we listen to constructive criticism, now we're not just dealing with critical negative spirits. We're hanging with the wise. It's so important. Hopefully, I've learned from both. Those that have been really tough and hard critics, and hopefully I've learned from those that really have my best interest in mind and have constructively challenged me over the course of my life. And I hope I continue to do that. (laughs) I'll never forget, uh, I need to remember this story regularly as I continue to preach because that's my greatest passion, I think, next to just my wife and girls. Obviously, I love Jesus, but this, this calling, I love to preach. But I remember when I was about 18 years old, I uh, hadn't gone to Bible college yet, anything, but I was fresh out of this time with God, speaking to my heart. I shifting gears from being a medical doctor to had changed my college plans, everything. This was, a, I mean, it was a whirlwind. And my father, affirming me, wanting me to have that opportunity, says, I want you to preach on Sunday night at church. Okay. This was an era long, long, long ago that we had church actually on Sunday morning and Sunday night. It was amazing. Okay. In a, in a galaxy far, far away. Okay. <laughs> but I remember my dad asked me preaching, man, I got up there and I started preaching and people, you know, they were cheering me. This was my home crowd. This was the home field advantage, okay? This was all the people that knew me since I was a little kid. And they were saying amen. And, man, I, that just pulled it out of me. And I was preaching as hard as I could go. Man, I was frothing, man. I was smoking. I was everything I could do, man. I was just doing everything I could. And then we came to the close of service, and I gave an invitation. I don't really know if they really needed to come forward, but they all came forward, you know. And they, they all got saved all over again, you know. And I was just like, Oh, this is the greatest history, you know, or greatest service in the history of the church. You know, I'm just like loving it. I'm just having a great time. I'm, I'm literally walking off, just walking on air. I'm just so excited. Man, we had a great service. Next morning, my dad said, hey, come on, go with me. I don't really know if we were going anywhere, okay? But he had a time that he wanted to have with his young son, okay? And so back in that era... They had cassette tapes. Guys, your moms and dads will have to explain what those are, okay? Google it this afternoon. on. They'll, they'll show you this little thing like this. Yeah, anyway, okay. I'll leave that up to mom and dad. He pops this in and he says, Ron, I want you to count how many times you say this phrase. Man, I was still on a high. Man, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be okay. He wanted me to learn a lesson that as a preacher, as a public speaker, communicator, that oftentimes when you're in front of your crowd, that you can get a catchphrase, um, just a help to help you fill the gaps between your statements and your comments. So you use it like a crutch. How many have ever heard somebody preach a sermon and uh, the guy would ask you to say amen like 400 times in the message. Anybody say amen, amen? And then he comes in there, say amen to that? You know, and they they just say that over and over and over again. Okay, it's kind of a crutch, and he's trying to teach a young preacher, hey, watch, learn, study how you preach, even listen to your own messages so you can be better for the Lord and for the people. Literally, within the first, like, two or three minutes, I had said the phrase, 
let me tell you something, folks, like 30 times. <laughs> let me tell you something, folks. And people are just like, way to go, Rod. Yeah, yeah, this is horrible, but we're cheering you on, you know. <laughs> yes, I'll give my heart to Jesus tonight, even though I'm a deacon in the church. You know, you know they were just helping me, okay? They were helping me out. But I want you to know, my father had everything in my best interest. It was not trying to grill me down. He was trying to give me something constructive to help me someday when I would preach to maybe more people than just a few, but I would have something that the crowd actually could learn something from the Lord and I could handle the word of God that the Lord had placed on my heart with such uh, effort and the right kind of effort that it would bless people and they would be drawn closer to what Jesus wants in their life. You see, we have to receive that at times. Let me hurry and get to the last couple things. Before I do, let me say this one thing. If you haven't in the last couple of years, or maybe even the last few months, if you've not tried to adjust a couple things in your life based on what maybe somebody has constructively or even harshly criticized you on, you know what? You're missing a growth opportunity. You make those adjustments because God's trying to grow you and lift you higher to be more influential for him in your life as a follower of, a, of Christ and as a spirit-led individual. So I encourage you, don't miss your growth opportunity. Let me finish with this fourth point. How do we respond to critical people? Here's the fourth strategy. You always work. You always work hard to guard your heart. You always work to guard your heart. I don't want to be the one with the critical spirit. How about you? I want to guard my heart. I want to be led by the spirit, not by my flesh. I want to guard my heart. Anybody in the room with me? I love it when I hear something to the context of about a person that says, you know what? I've never heard that person ever say something bad about another individual. Wow. Wow. What a great affirmation of a person's life. I'll never forget the first time I heard that. It was my father. I was about 12 years old. And there was a man in our church named Henry McKay. I'll never forget Henry McKay because of that statement that my father said about him. I've never heard that man ever say anything bad or critical about another person in my entire life. I thought, wow, wow, that guy, that guy is the kind of guy that I want to be like. That's the kind of person that walks with Jesus to the point that they live above the fray. They've learned not to let the, the criticisms and the negativity of our world impact them where they've carried on that same critical spirit that they've seen and experienced, but they lived above it. They didn't know how to overlook others' offenses and live and forgive in real time. Wow, it's so impressive. I pray, I, I wish I could say that would be said about me, but unfortunately, I know myself. I know I get frustrated and I can get critical as much as anybody else. And I'm saying, God, help me guard my heart. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I pray for that. I pray that every day. It's one of my constant verses of scripture that I pray over my life in my, in my private altar. I want you to do something. I know this is kind of odd, but I want you to reach up and just touch your tongue. Okay. I'm not going to talk while I'm touching my tongue, right? Okay, you can wipe your hand off. Okay. You say, why did you just ask us to do that? Because you know what? I don't want you to ever forget this. The tongue has the power of life or death, the scripture says. So what's it going to be for you? What's it going to be for you? Are you going to speak life into people or are you going to speak death over people? Are you going to build them up or are you going to criticize them down? One of my dear friends, he went to be with the Lord a couple years ago in a tragic motorcycle accident. But B.G. Nevitt, <laughs> he had a phrase that on his stationery, he had it permanently apart, embossed into his stationery. It was a part of the logo. 
if you got a card from him, if you got an email, it was a part of the signature of his email. Always build up, never tear down. I love that. I love that. He'd sign his name, you know, BG, and then it, underneath it, you'd see, always build up, never tear down. It's our choice. Proverbs 12, 18 says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. I want to be a healer. I want to be somebody that speaks life, not death, into other people. We do this because of our sinful nature. We're wired this way, but we can work hard to not be the critical ones if we guard our hearts. We don't have to tear people down. We don't have to dislike how they spend their money or, or I know as a leader, I, I, can, I can slice and dice a, a leadership structure real easy and criticize and ass, assess it, okay, but really being critical. Look at the way others raise their kids. You can be critical of them. You know, raising kids, you're just praying God to help us survive, okay? (laughs) But listen to me. A critical heart, a critical heart is always born out of either pride, ignorance, or hurt. We have to become deeply grounded in who we are in Christ to overcome criticism, whether we're getting criticism or we're trying to guard our hearts to not criticize others. We've got to be firmly grounded in God. Listen to me. Sometimes people give you compliments and praise. Listen, I'm not driven by praise and I'm not de- derailed by criticism. We've got to get that point. Tamara was talking about this with me today and she said, you know, I heard this just a Uh, A little while ago, she said, don't let praise go to your head and don't let criticism go to your heart. It's so good. God help us. We just know that when we serve God, there's going to be points of criticism inside the church and outside the church. Let me close with a verse of scripture found in Romans 14, 12. It says this. So why, so why, Paul's saying this to believers, why do you contend another believer why do you look down on another believer remember hold on we will all stand before the judgment seat of God yes each of us will give a personal account to God so let's stop condemning each other you know what the word of God tells us that we will literally stand before the throne of God someday And the scripture says that we will give an account for every word that comes from our mouths. Every word. So we've got to guard our hearts as we face the reality that we can fail as much as anybody else. As I was walking last night uh, around the neighborhood, the Lord dropped something in my heart because we've been talking in our Wednesday night prayer service about our our private altar. We're, We're trying to develop a corporate altar for our church, but... It it stems on our personal private altars. The Lord just whispered and he said, Ron, the more you worship me in your private altar, the harder it is to criticize my creation and my children. And I want you to think about that. The more you're in the presence of God and the more you realize what God has done for you and you worship him, why would you want to criticize something that God has created why would you want to criticize one of his children? So we need to guard ourselves, guard our hearts. I want you to stand to your feet if you would. I want to challenge you today. Thanks so much for watching this Evangel Church teaching. We hope it encouraged you in your journey with Jesus. If you have never made the choice to follow Jesus and live for him, we want to help you take that step. The Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and we all need a savior. The good news is, Jesus can be your savior. All you have to do is accept that you have sinned, believe in Jesus Christ, and confess that he will be your Lord and savior. Would you pray this prayer with me today? Jesus, I know I have sinned. There are things in my life that need to change. And today, I am making a choice. I choose to follow you. I want you to be the Lord and savior of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, 
we want to encourage you to fill out the form below by clicking the I have decided button. That way we can follow up with you and encourage you. Also, if you're not currently a part of a life-giving local church, we want to invite you to be a part of Evangel Church. Our goal is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ by helping them know God, find life, discover purpose, and make a difference. You can join us on Sundays at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m.